Hi, I'm Dylan, and you're listening to the Animals at Home podcast. Joining me today is Nancy Mirelli, also known as Cybugs on most social media platforms. Nancy is an entomologist who currently lives in Ecuador. And if you're somebody who's really into reptiles and you're thinking, ugh, do I really want to be listening to an episode about bugs or insects? I urge you to stick around and listen to this episode. If I was you in your shoes, I would have probably been thinking the same thing. And that's part of the reason why I reached out to an entomologist, because I really didn't have a ton of knowledge about insects, and because of that, I wasn't a huge fan of them, and I was also kind of afraid of them. And I have to say that after having this conversation with Nancy, my perspective has completely shifted. And I do admit, I actually looked up a care guide for a tarantula. Now, I'm not running out to get one anytime soon, but that is how far I came just in this interview, thinking, oh, that's interesting. Bugs are not as scary or as creepy as you might think. Now that is 100% due to Nancy's infectious passion. You will immediately recognize it when you hear her voice. She is incredibly excited about uh, insects and bugs and she's really doing some amazing work kind of helping flip people's perspectives. In the episode she tells me some mind-blowing facts about leafcutter ants. She tells a terrifying story about a tarantula hawk. If you don't know what a tarantula hawk is, you should listen to this episode because it is scary but very interesting. And she also gives some really interesting tips for anybody that wants to get into the husbandry of tarantulas or any type of insects and if you are getting into that or you're thinking that you might this is definitely an episode that you'd want to listen to now if you are listening to this on itunes or stitcher you're definitely going to want to eventually go check out the youtube version of this as well because nancy does show us some really interesting visuals from the homemade jewelry that she makes out of beetle shells as well as some really interesting collection of pinned insects she has on her wall As always, you can find the show notes to the episode at animalsathome.ca. Any of the interesting facts, links, or articles that we talked about throughout this podcast, you'll find in the show notes. And make sure you stick around to the very end so you can hear how you can help me produce the Animals at Home podcast. Enjoy the show. Nancy, thank you very much for joining us today. I really appreciate you coming. Thank you so much for inviting me. This is awesome. Yeah, well, I'm super excited. Uh, I don't know a ton about bugs, so that's why well, I'm you're super- you're going to. <laughs> yes, so I'm very excited about that. A lot of the people that follow my content are reptile enthusiasts, but I t- there tends to be a lot of crossover between the reptile hobby, people who are interested in reptiles and insects, for the most part anyway. I am one yeah, of those I've noticed that too. Um, in Georgia, there was a crazy reptile convention called Repticon, and you'd always find like not only awesome snakes and lizards, but really cool live arthropods that you could buy. Yeah, no, oh, there's definitely a huge crossover. And for someone like myself, I have not crossed over yet, but maybe after this, I will. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so I want to start with, we'll talk about, I think you're the first person I've ever met that has claims over a hashtag. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was kind of an accident. Um, so the hashtag is Facebook and it started, I think with my friend Miles, like a couple years ago, and he created this hashtag called Facebook off where all of us entomologists just try to find the biggest bugs we possibly could to put on our face. And it was like a, a competition of like who could find the biggest and coolest ones. But I was living in Ecuador and I just never got bored of it because I didn't have winter. Like eventually everyone else had to stop because they had winter and I just kept going. And I eventually shortened it to Facebook because Facebook off was like too long because back in the day, you only got 120 characters on Twitter. Right. Yeah, back in the day. Um, and then I realized that they were getting shared a lot and tweeted a lot. And so I just added like little bits of bug biology to it. So it kind of really served three functions. One, it showed in the rainforest, like how big some of these bugs are. Like there's a moth that has a 12 inch wingspan. It's like literally a foot long. It's like this big on my face. And so you can show it on your hand, but like your hand disappears. You still can't even tell how big it is. So it shows how big some of these bugs are. It shows that they're not dangerous, right? I wouldn't put it near my eyes or my eyeballs, like if it was super dangerous. And I could just add a little bit of biology about it, you know, to make it seem even less scary. Something cool that we're studying about it or like a little tidbit about it. And then I was just kind of doing that on my own. And then I was I applied for the Twitter account Real Scientist, which is when a real scientist, as the name suggests, curates the account for a week. And I was like, yeah, I just like do this Facebook thing. And like, it just took off. Like, it was crazy. I wasn't even expecting it. And, it, and then all of a sudden, like people were contacting me about like this crazy Facebook thing. So yeah, that, that's how it started. <laughs> yeah, that's very cool. I, I, I thought hashtags just appeared out of nowhere. It's funny because you never see who actually created it originally. So yeah. I, that's yeah. fun. 
Um, so do you, when did your obsession with insects or bugs start? Do you remember or? There... I've always, okay. So I always joke that my parents were crazy and they, I grew up on a one lane dirt road in the middle of nowhere. Okay. Like there was one other girl on my street and <laughs> that was it. So my parents were like, this only child is running around like crazy in the house. We'll just throw her outside for, you know, the whole day. So that way we don't have to deal with her. <laughs> so there's like threw me outside until dinner and I, I'm nearsighted. So I just played with anything that crawled on the ground, frogs, lizards, toads, bugs, whatever. It didn't, it didn't really matter. And so I never really thought that I liked bugs specifically. I thought I just liked crawly things in general. And then I uh, fast forward to college and I had a project studying birds. And on the first day I realized like, wow, birds are actually awful to study. Sorry, bird people, but I <laughs> hated studying birds. <laughs> like, and I just got involved with the dragonfly survey project. I fell in a swamp kept trying to catch a dragonfly and it was like the best day ever. I got involved in the pollinator project. And then I still didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. So I went to Australia and did a generalized ecology term abroad where I came back with like one picture of a kangaroo and about 300 pictures of insects that I was offended that no one knew what they were. <laughs> I was like, there's this beetle, it's black and has electric green stripes down the side of it. And you're telling me you don't know what this creature is? Like, that's ridiculous. So um, I think it was just kind of the unknown and that I'd always liked them. I, I always thought they were really beautiful. And so after Australia, I was like, maybe I like bugs maybe I should go to grad school to study insects. <laughs> so, so that's how it started. That's how it started. But a lot of people just like know from the beginning, I didn't know how much I liked bugs. And I didn't know it was weird to like bugs until like I kept getting older and kept people, I was like, oh, there's a giant tarantula in Australia. Let's get it in a bucket. And everyone else is like screaming and crying and running away. So yeah, well, yeah. that's the weird thing is um, why are we so afraid of bugs? Because obviously for the most part, as someone who I'm kind of afraid of bugs as well. Um, well, I guess I'm the type of person that will not kill a bug. Like it drives Yay. my girlfriend crazy. Yeah. I'm not one of those killers. <laughs> like she goes crazy because you know, we'll have a bug crawling in the apartment and she gets so mad because I won't kill it. I'll just take it outside. But I'm the guy that puts it on a napkin because I'm too scared to touch it for the most part. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> so there, and but like when I rationally think about it, I know most bugs are completely harmless, but there's mm -hmm. some underlying fear that so many people have. Like, what do you think that comes from? So there's all these studies actually that show that most kids are actually interested and think bugs are cool until about second to fourth grade. And then there's this switch that just happens in them. And it seems to be a learned behavior, either from friends, parents, the media certainly doesn't help. Like if you, uh, my friend and I at DragonCon, we just did a whole panel about how insects inspire aliens. So when people are looking at insects that they, they seem weird, they seem creepy, like all of our monsters are based on how insects look, like how insects move or how our monsters are based off of. So it seems to be a combination of all of these things together, plus mixed with the unknown. So I have problems with many biology classes in the United States because they're like, Biology is the study of life. Insects make up 58% of the biodiversity on the planet. And somehow almost all biology classes leave out the bugs. Mm -hmm. So you have these things that are portrayed really crazy in movies. You have parents who have, you know, teach their kids that bugs are scary. Kids and people in general really only come in contact with like spiders and cockroaches and don't go outside to see like dragonflies and butterflies and ladybugs and fireflies, which are all insects too and beautiful. And so I think it's just like a combination of all of these things together. I found the more people hang out with me and the more people learn about insects, the less afraid they are and the more beautiful and the more interesting and the more intriguing people find them. Yeah. I mean, I guess the same kind of thing with snakes. Like I have snakes and people kind of have the same fear of them, but I think I never thought about that. You're right. That the education wise, when we're studying biology, nobody really thinks of insects, despite how obviously incredibly important uh, they are. So, but I think there's even that, I guess I'm trying to think when you're looking at a bug, it does look creepy, but maybe that's just because it's been, that's kind of 
we, they've used that image as the creepy thing in so in so many forms in of media. So many forms of media. Yeah. Um, again, my my friend and I, we just did a whole hour long panel at Dragon Con specifically about that. Like, and it's not just the aliens. It's like their spaceships. If there are real insects, like the Indiana Jones movie where he's like in the cockroach pit. Um, there's like cockroaches in there, Australian stick insects, like harlequin beetles. And if you look at my Instagram profile, you can see a lot of those bugs that they use, that they put them in a scary context. They're like on my hand. They're mm -hmm. like on my face, you know, like they're not actually scary, but because no one knows about them and they're put in the context of this like scary scene in a movie, people just automatically associate this weird alien crazy looking thing is dangerous but yeah. like literally one of the insects that they used in that it can't jump it can't fly it can't bite and it can't sting it literally like just sits there and that's its top speed <laughs> yeah well i think the biting and the stinging and then i guess that would be part of the unknown like you said everybody assumes that a bug is going to bite you or sting you yeah and i guess probably most don't do that at all most don't and so if you look at it from the insects or tarantula or spiders perspective it's kind of just like snakes like venom biologically is very expensive to make mm -hmm. so unless they think they can eat you which they obviously can't they're not going to use it unless they absolutely have to even tarantulas will go through about four or five behaviors before they bite you so a tarantula if it's scared the first thing it'll try and do is run away the second thing it'll do is it'll like curl up into a little ball and be like, I'm, I'm, please, please leave me alone. I'm very scared. Thank you. The third thing it'll do, if it's a new world tarantula, it, or actually all tarantulas will do this. They will throw their legs up in the air and show their fangs. And they'll be like, mm -hmm. I'm really big. I'm really scary. Please leave me alone. And then the fourth thing, the new world tarantulas, they'll kick their hairs off, which stick in your skin like fiberglass and are itchy. And then the fifth thing it'll do is bite you. So, I mean, if you're harassing it through all of those behaviors, like, I'm sorry, that's like a you problem and not a tarantula problem. Yeah. Like, if you walk up to a dog and it starts growling and you're like, continue petting it, like, if it bites you, that that's your own fault. <laughs> yeah. No, definitely. Yeah. And I, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think anyone's been attacked by bugs before, right? Like, you're always in their environment or doing something. And right. uh, like where I live, we have a lot of in the, in the summer, we have tons of hornets and people always freak out about the, the hornets because they right. tend to gather at like picnics and things. But, um, I mean, we also have mosquitoes, which are the ones that I have to say, I have to, I kill mosquitoes. <laughs> I, I also kill mosquitoes. I have the personal space rule, which is like, if I were to walk up to a bear and I punched it in the face, like the bear would, the, the bear would kill me and that would be fine because I invaded its personal space. So I apply that to like horse flies and mosquitoes and other biting insects. Like if you come to me and you specifically bite me, like it's, you you are you are getting a, a smackdown. <laughs> okay, good. I'm glad that I'm glad we're allowed to kill those mosquitoes. Uh, this year was actually not bad for mosquitoes, but a few years ago I was in Costa Rica and I actually got dengue from a, like wow. I got bit by like one mosquito and he gave me dengue. That's all it takes. Yeah, um, that's all it takes. So that was uh, that was pretty horrible. But um, so in in uh, the the size of the insects in Ecuador. <laughs> Yeah. are insane. insane. Like people yeah. here in Canada, bugs are relatively small. We don't really have big bugs because we have such mm -hmm. a harsh winter. Yes. But some of those things that I've seen on your face <laughs> are huge. Can you tell, can, like, I can't remember what the one, it's like, it was green, I think. Uh, it almost looks uh, like a grasshopper, but it's. Yeah. So there's a, there's a giant Katie did down here. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it, I don't think it has a common name. We all just call it the giant Katie did. Uh, and yeah, so we think insects get bigger here in the tropics because there isn't a harsh winter. So you have no definite growing season. So if you're up in the north, you have to start off in it as an egg um, and complete enough of your development to survive the winter. And some insects survive the winter as the egg stage, some survive as the pupa. Um, but regardless, like you have a relatively short, I need to grow up and then breed before the winter comes. And in Ecuador, we just have the rainy season and the dry season, which really is like the rainy season and the more rainy season. Right. <laughs> but we have the same temperature year round. Um, you know, we have ample uh, rainfall. So you have this continuous growing season and bugs can just reach adult stages and it can take them longer and that's fine. And then also the relative humidity. So many insects here in 
the jungles like won't actually drink. There's just an, enough humidity in the air that it enters the body cavity through what are called spiracles on the side of the body, which is used for breathing, but because but because it's just so humid, like water enters as well. So the increased humidity and the longer growing season, I think is why we have bigger insects down here. So is that part of the reason why you moved down to Ecuador to, to continue working with insects? Yeah. So when I graduated with my master's from the University of Georgia, um, I was only supposed to volunteer in an eco lodge for about six months. And basically my question was like, I, my master's was a little bit rough for me and, I, and it really made me question whether or not I actually wanted to go into academia. Like, was this the right path for me? And I knew I loved teaching. That was why I went to grad school. I was like, do I like teaching enough to make it a career? And I decided that maybe academia wasn't the right way, but maybe working with the public on insects could be the right way. So I came down to Ecuador to work at an eco lodge because almost everyone comes and are like, the birds are so amazing and the mammals are so amazing. So for me to be able to be, give night walks and presentations about insects was just a really amazing opportunity for me. And I think it was good a good opportunity for people who may never have even thought about bugs to actually get a good look at them and have someone tell them what they were. And I just fell in love with it. Like it was just, I fell in love with Ecuador. I fell in love with the bugs down here. I hate winter. So this, like, this is good for me too. Yeah. <laughs> And I just stayed and I've been working on doing my own tours through like me personally. So if you want to come down to Ecuador and look at cool bugs, like I'm, I'm here. So, <laughs> so you'll take, you'll take just people out into the, into the rainforest or something and, and uh, show them some bugs that you can find in the wild. Yep, exactly. That's exactly what we do. Um, I personally love the cloud forest and the coastal ecosystems. So, but yeah, that's exactly what I do. Like I'll bring you to an eco lodge or um, if I go to the coast, we get a hotel on the coast and then drive into the jungle because the jungle is actually isn't that far. It's like 10 minutes away from the beach, <laughs> which is amazing. And yeah, we just go and do jungle walks. Um, I know a decent amount about ecology in general. And then I bring a local with us who's good at finding birds and monkeys. I'm pretty good with at least the common birds. And there are howler monkeys and sloths down there as well. So it's kind of like a, a generalized ecology tour and then with like a focus on insects. And then at night, I even set up a bug light and we get to go into the jungle at like midnight with a big light and see what we get into the sheet. So do you find people who are typically maybe go into that experience being a little bit afraid of bugs? Did they come out relatively excited about bugs? Yes, that happens all the time. And I think it just goes back to that education. I've had so many people tell me that like, just because you are so calm, just because you know what you can pick up, just because you go and you pick up the creature and like, I don't make anyone hold or touch anything, but I'm sitting there like super calm, like, Hey, this thing like can't hurt you. Would you like to touch it? Or would you maybe like to hold it? And I think just having someone there to tell them, like, not all bugs are going to kill you. Like, most of them can't even do any damage to you. And, like, its top speed is walking across my hand. Like, <laughs> so I've had that a lot. And I, I, like, I, I love it so much. I can't even explain it. It's like, I feel like fear is so powerful. Like, when you're afraid of something, it just it just grips you and you can't, you can't do anything about it. And you act irrationally because you're so afraid. And so I feel like I have a bit of a superpower where I, I like take that away from people and they, they come back and they're like, Oh, I'm not as afraid of insects anymore. Like I had one person say, I'm really fascinated and I ordered a book and I'm going to read more about them. So yeah. Wow. Yeah, no, that's, that's really interesting. So obviously you have a huge passion for it and you kind of have that key to unlocking the fear with, uh, I, I can definitely see that. Cause I mean, you can tell that talking to you, how enthusiastic you are about yeah, it. And, and there's you. a lot of, I mean, like we said, nobody knows anything about bugs for the most part. Are there any bugs that scare you? There is one that I have a very healthy respect for. Um, and it kind of, and this story will show you that again, insects don't want to sting you without any reason. There is a type of wasp that is called a tarantula hawk. It mm. wrestles tarantulas and wins. Like this, this wasp will sting, will like wrestle the tarantula and then sting it and deliver a venom that keeps it alive but paralyzed. And then the wasp will drag the tarantula to a burrow, push it into the burrow, lay its eggs on top of it and seal the burrow. So the larva of the wasp are eating a tarantula that is kept alive but paralyzed. These things have the second most painful insect sting 
Some of them get to be about that big, like a couple inches. They're not small. And this was when I learned that you should never wear your headlamp on your head at night because then all the bugs fly towards it. So we were at the bug light and we got one of these, like they're beautiful insects. We got one of the tarantula hawks in and it was one of the huge ones and it flew straight at the headlamp and got stuck in my hair, like up here. Oh my and God. Like, and I'm like, okay, this thing has like the second most painful insect sting. And I was like buzzing angrily and I really did freak out, but I was like, okay, you can't squash it. You can't, you just have to stay as calm as possible. And eventually it untangled itself and flew away and it didn't even sting me. So so I guess that's a good example of, I mean, that thing was probably freaked out. That gives me goosebumps just listening to that story. Yeah. yeah. I was like, okay, headlamp from now on ever, if you're in the jungle, goes in your hand like a flashlight because mm -hmm. yeah, otherwise all the bugs just fly at your face. So when you say it's beautiful, can you describe a little bit what, because I, I think I've seen pictures of it before, but can you describe what, like what it looks so nice? Yeah, it's, um, so it's a pretty hefty wasp and it's like this midnight blue, this midnight iridescent blue with orange wings. Like it's really beautiful. Yeah. It's a, it does look very nice. It's a look, but don't touch. Yes. And exactly. <laughs> that's exactly what it's doing. Like those bright contrasting colors. So it's not quite black, but it's like that midnight blue, the midnight blue in contrast to the orange is saying, Hey, back off. Like I can sting you and I will if I have to. And what is the reaction that happens to a human? Just severe pain type thing? It just hurts a lot yeah. for a long time. Yeah. And so it's like, it's similar to the bullet ant. Um, and I'm not as afraid of the bullet ant because the bullet ants have like pretty standard behavior. And as long as you're paying attention to what you put your hands down, because they don't fly, they don't fly at you. Right. So, um, yeah, they feel very similar to the bullet ant and having had friends who have been stung by the bullet ant, uh, you know, they say like their whole arm has gone numb, like they can feel it, it just hurt, like it's called the bullet ant for a reason. And there's no, there's no anti-venom, like it's not going to kill you or anything. So if you get stung by one of those insects in the, in like the middle of the Amazon, they, they can't really do anything for you because you're like so far out, you're like too hours up the river in a boat ride. So they're like, just take some Advil and sleep. You'll be fine. It'll go away. <laughs> It'll go away eventually. It's going to, it's going to suck for a while, but you'll be all right. So is the bullet ant the number one? Is that? Bullet ant is number one. Okay. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah. So I think I've only been, well, I, here's a question because this is when I was talking about, we have lots of hornets here. Everybody, mm -hmm. I think, misnames these animals or yes. these the insects all the time, right? There's people call them mm -hmm. wasps or hornets or yellow jackets. Um, what's the difference? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, so ants, bees, and wasps are actually all in the same group called Hymenoptera. They're all actually related. And so bees are like their own evolutionary line and ants are their own evolutionary line. And wasps are like, ev wasps and hornets are just everything that's left. And so basically, colloquially, hornet is like a big scary wasp, but biologically, they're there, there's not really a difference. Um, what we tend to think of as wasps like yellow jackets and uh, paper wasps, they're in their own family called Vespidae. Um, but some of what we call hornets as well are also in Vespidae. So it just seems to be like people are like, that wasp is particularly large and particularly scary. We're going to call it a hornet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like it, has no, like, it has no biological definition. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. That's what I was kind of thinking because that those names do get tossed around and everybody seems to know exactly like, no, that's a hornet. No, that's a wasp. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't think you know. <laughs> yeah. Like there's one that people call hornet all the time. It's actually called a cicada killer. And again, it has a pretty powerful sting, um, but it almost never stings people. Like you can lawnmower over them and they just like fly out of the way. And they specifically attack cicadas and people are like, I saw the biggest, scariest hornet ever. And it was like coming at me. And I'm like, Oh, can you show me a picture? And I'm like, Oh, that's actually a cicada killer. They're really docile. And all they do is attack cicadas. Yeah. But it's just cause they look huge. People think that they're, they're a hornet. Yeah. Yeah. People are definitely always afraid of the, the bite for sure. Yeah. So have you, when you were in doing your masters, I guess, what, what did your research focus on? Was there a specific yeah, I ended up switching my master's project halfway. So my first master's project was actually looking at the endosymbionts, which are bacteria that live inside aphids, and how those endosymbionts are 
conferring protection to those aphids. So remember how I said there is that tarantula hawk that lays its eggs on the tarantula and the larvae eat it from the inside out? Well, there's a wasp that does the same thing to aphids, except they actually inject the egg into the aphid, keep it alive, the larva eat it from the inside out, and then bust out of the body cavity at the end. <laughs> you can see where alien came from. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, so one of these bacteria that live inside the aphid actually kill the wasp larva before it can kill the aphid. So there's all these like really kind of crazy inception like things that are happening inside a little aphid. So all of a sudden you have an insect that's two or three millimeters long that's basically conferring a whole ecosystem of gut flora uh, and endosymbiotic bacteria. Then you have these wasps. And so that, that was originally what I was studying. And then I just I decided that like research and genetic work just wasn't for me, <laughs> obviously, as I'm out in the field now. And so I ended up switching my project to an integrated pest management project, which I focused more on education. So how can we teach people about controlling controlling their environment to control pests in in a school setting? And that's what that's what I ended up getting my master's for. Yeah, I guess that's the other area that you know, typically when bugs come into people's lives, it's, it's unwanted, right? Because they, yeah. they do have a pest issue. And, yes. uh, but so, so in terms of reducing pests, I guess it's like, put your garbage away. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's simple things like that. Um, it's basically reducing food, habitat, and water. So if cockroaches, especially like being touched on all sides and they're designed to crawl under tree bark, which is why your cabinets are a perfect place for them, right? Uh, so if you have food like chips, don't just close it with a clip, like put it in a Tupperware. Keep your cereal in a Tupperware. Keep, get a garbage can that closes all the way. Um, if you have any spots, like little holes and things, like sometimes you have cha metal chairs with like the holes on the side of like the base, like that's a perfect spot for cockroaches. So just like close those, for example. Basically just making your habitat cleaner, less humid, and with less food will get rid of most of your pest problems. Right. No, that makes sense. I guess for me, I, like we don't have cockroaches where I live, so I think we're fortunate, but I guess that's an actual big issue when, when you start going south that's yeah in georgia florida uh, the german cockroach is a big problem in new york it's funny because everyone in florida is like oh like the, the cockroaches the american cockroaches the palmetto bugs um they're huge and they fly they do they are huge like they're like that big they're like an inch and a half not like an inch and a quarter maybe to an inch and a half so they're pretty they're pretty big but the cockroaches here in ecuador that get into people's houses are like we have them as pets like it's the salt and the salt and pepper cockroaches or the death head cockroaches that you can buy at like repticon and things like that um what we have as pets in the states they're actually pests here in ecuador and they're like this big and they fly and they come into the house and i'm the only one excited about them but. Yeah, like oh more pests <laughs> yeah they're like oh these cockroaches that are huge <laughs> yeah it's pretty funny yeah those are uh so do you have any or pets or have you in the past had insects as pets i i did have um insects as pets before I travel too much now uh, I can keep I can barely keep my plants alive so, yeah. <laughs> so we just leave it at plants currently um but in the states I had a pet praying mantis and I actually had two pet millipedes that gave birth and I was really excited and the millipedes were really awesome because they glowed under under black light so whenever people visited my house I was like look at my glowing millipedes so it gave birth how many babies does that it mean? laid eggs. I don't know. I had like a hundred, hundred, hundred some odd in there. Did they hatch? Yeah. And then it, was, it happened right before I moved to Ecuador. So then I let them all to my friend and I had dug them out of the log in my backyard in Georgia. So then when she moved, she just put them all back. Oh, <laughs> are there, are there any insects in the pet trade that should not be kept as insects in your opinion or as pets? Um, anything without a permit, uh, because I work in conservation, there's a lot of people who will come down and buy and like smuggle live insects, live tarantulas for the pet trade. And I don't mind, like if you have a permit for them or like you live in Europe, like Europe is very kind of liberal with their permits. Um, not in the fact that you can just go wherever and take them out, but the species that you can own. And so a lot of them in Europe are captive bred because they're, they're a little bit more open with what you can have. Um, for example, in Europe, you can have a whole bunch of stick insects in the States. You need permits for the same stick insects. Um, 
But my feeling on that is like, I don't let, I don't think it's okay. If you go to an ecosystem, you pull out 700 tarantulas and then you try and sell them as live pets around the world. It just like, it wouldn't be okay with monkeys or it wouldn't be okay with parrots. It's not okay with tarantulas. And Ecuador is actually very, very strict about that. Um, they caught someone who was literally smuggling, I think it was like 641 tarantulas out of trying out of the country, like just in a suitcase. And it got caught uh, randomly. It was like a random bag search that they found it. And that, that guy just got really unlucky. Um, so yeah, like don't, don't buy wild things, please. Yeah. Oh yeah. That, and that's definitely a message that I give all the time is that yeah. there's a ton of captive bred opportunity in North America and that's what you should be accessing. Yeah, and that's what you should be doing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, there are a couple of things that people, I think you probably have the same thing. People don't do their research. Like if you're interested in a tarantula, there are some tarantulas that are just naturally more aggressive than others. Like the arboreal species that are really beautiful, tend to be more skittish and a little bit more aggressive, not good for your first tarantula, not good for your five-year-old. Female tarantulas can live 20 years. Wow. Uh, so it's a commitment, right? Don't get your five-year-old a tarantula because it will be going to college with them. <laughs> and so just, you know, do some research on the, on the arthropod that you want to get. Make sure, you know, it's in the lifespan. I just actually had a funny story with this because my friend's five-year-old daughter just did a bug camp. And they were like, you can have a hissing cockroach. And all the kids like fell in love with the hissing cockroaches. And so my, like my friend, the mom, she messaged me and she's like, what is the hissing cockroach eat? And I was like, oh, you can feed it dog food, table scraps, just a little sponge with water and it. it'll be fine. And then I was like, you know, they live for five years, right? And she was like, really? <laughs> and I was like, enjoy your six legged hamster. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. That's a long yeah. time. I yeah, guess you probably assume like a couple time. months. <laughs> right, exactly. So just know the lifespan of your animal and also where it comes from before you get it. And also the permit status of it. So again, in the United States, many of the exotic walking sticks and mantises you need permits for. In Europe and Australia, they're much more kind of liberal with that. Um, but yeah, just, just get everything captive bred, please. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. That's uh, that's super important. Do you think, is there one or two things that the average public doesn't know about bugs that they should that would change their opinion on them in terms of their importance for the ecosystem or, or anything else? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is people don't realize how many insects there are. And I think if people realize like how, like I was saying that insects make up 58% of the biodiversity on the planet. That means every named thing. If you take every named thing, 58% of them are bugs. Uh, there are over 1,200,000 described insect species, and there are 350,000 beetle species. We are now crawling up towards like almost 400,000 beetle species, and just beetles make up 20% of the biodiversity on the planet. Wow. So that means if you were to count every named thing on your fingers, like every time you got back to your thumb, it would be another beetle. That's just how many there are. So when you're like, I'm afraid of bugs, like you're saying a like lot there. How? <laughs> you're saying a lot there. Like, like there's more bugs than just cockroaches and like termites and ants and bees and wasps. And they are, they fill every niche in the ecosystem they, their evolution is so old, like dinosaurs died out 65 million years ago. That's when the asteroid hit. Bugs evolved 400 million years ago. So they've been here a long time. They're super diverse and our ecosystem runs on them. We need them for everything, for decomposition of, of like uh, carbon tree material, um, soil turnover, decomposition of animal matter. So it's like, if we didn't have flies and fly maggots, I realize they're gross, but we would be sky high in carcasses. And that's grosser in my opinion, <laughs> like pollinating services, um, like water ecosystem services, food chain services, like insect, like the ecosystems would just fall apart if you took insects out of them. Is there, is there an estimation on a biology side of how many insects that we have not discovered yet? Like, do they have a number what they think? Yes. Um, the, so there's a conservative number and, a, and like a more liberal number. Um, the conservative number is that we think there's about 5 million insects and the liberal number is about, or yeah, 5 million insects and the liberal number is about 10 million insects. 
So probably somewhere, and we have 1,200,000 described already. So uh, yeah, we have another four to 9 million left to just- That is insane. <laughs> Yeah. That is just crazy. And like, like, why can't we find them? I guess they're, they're just, they're so, they're just so uh, such a specific ecological niche that you'd such have to a find. Such a specific ecological niche. Like, you know, you could be walking through the jungle and it's not just like this jungle has them. It's like this log and it's like this half of the log has just that species. And then also many, like, no one cares about small little brown beetles. It's not a dinosaur. It's not a bird. It's not a mammal. So you have to be like, you either have to give it a really weird name. Um, so like there's one that's like the species, a species epithet is Bazinga from Big the Big Bang Theory. There's one uh, named after Beyonce. It's a fly. And so you have to give it a weird name to get like the media to care. Or you have to name like 20 new species at a time to even be what we consider worth like a scientific publication. So, yeah. <laughs> I guess that makes sense. Yeah, you can't yeah. really write a paper on one new beetle. It's got to be right. something bigger. To put, uh, to put these numbers into perspective, there's about five to 6,000 mammal species and there are 10,000 bird species. There are 20,000 butterflies just butterflies. That is crazy. So I guess the actual biomass of insects, it must be, even though they're tiny little things, way more than mammals. And, I mean, and yeah, mammals. I mean, you know, you have ants that have colonies in the trillions. Like, like I, I wish in my, during my time in the eco lodge, we had three leaf cutter and ant colonies and each leaf cutter ant colony can have three to 4 million ants in it. It goes 24 feet deep into the ground and about 150 square meters wide. Wow. Like they're not small. They, they cut highways into the grass. You can see where they walk because they create paths about this wide, just going through the jungle. Cause they just like cut it out of the way. You have 3 million ants walking on it every day for, and the Queens can live 10 years. Wow. At least 10 years down there. So, you know, you have this fully functioning colony for 10 years. Yeah. Well, leafcutter ants are super interesting. They, uh, I, I, when I was in Costa Rica, I saw them all the time and you just see, they, they all carry this giant leaf piece of leaf anyway. And you just, it's easy that they're all over the jungle or in, in the rainforest in Costa Rica anyway. Like it's so easy to find them and, and they're just walking in this line, taking their leaf down to their, uh, their home, I guess. Yeah, so they actually don't eat the leaf. They bring the leaf down and they grow a fungus on it and then they harvest the fungus. So they're actually farmers. Oh, interesting. So the fungus is, for, they, they eat the fungus or? Yeah, they eat the fungus. So they, wow. they collect specific species of plants that they can grow their fungus on and then they harvest the fungus on their little leaves. They actually have chambers inside that are gardens and they grow the fungus in these little leaf gardens and then they harvest the fungus because the fungus, you know, will have a fruiting body eventually. And then so they'll cut the fruiting body off and then that's what they eat. Wow. I literally sound like you just made that up. <laughs> yeah, I, I know, that's right? Amazing. I had no <laughs> idea that. that so, so they actually have these little caverns full of pieces of yeah. root. And then I guess yeah. the environment inside the cavern is... Is kept, works yeah, them. maintained at, a, at, a, at the right temperature, humidity, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Wow. That is, that is super interesting. So do you, are, are there some other... Um, really interesting facts about bugs that when you tell people they're just kind of like just happened to me. <laughs> yeah. Um, my favorite is that, you know, we always think about insects kind of at the bottom of the food chain. My favorite stories are the ones that were insects are like, haha, take that vertebrates. So, um, praying mantises have been documented by national geographic of sitting on hummingbird feeders and just taking down hummingbirds. Wow. Yeah. Um, there's this thing called a giant water bug because it's a bug. It lives in the water and it's about this big and it has this mouth part that comes down into basically these four needles and can inject venom along the spinal column of snakes and just eat snakes. Like there's pictures on oh Google God. of these things eating turtles. I mean, they're small turtles, but I mean, turtles nonetheless, turtles and snakes, um, dragonfly nymphs, which have this really amazing bottom lip that opens up kind of like a hand and goes out and catches the whatever's in front of it. And sometimes it's fish. So you can have like these stories of invertebrates like insects killing and eating vertebrates just make me so happy <laughs> yeah you're like we finally get a win <laughs> yes win <laughs> yeah no that's awesome so the, those butterflies behind you are those 
And are they from Ecuador or are they just they are. collected over time? Oh, okay. Yeah, these are all from Ecuador. These are actually all, all these insects are from the Amazon region. Um, and it's kind of funny how I got them, speaking of, you know, taking things out of the wild, because there was a collector here. And he, and so, and I don't blame local people at all for this, right? It's like someone comes in, they offer you money to like take bugs out of the jungle. Like the local people need money, right? Um, so it's like collectors just come down and they want bugs on their wall. And there was one of those people here. And then he decided after his five years in Ecuador to return to Canada. And these are illegal to bring back to, to Canada without the proper permits. Mm. So it, I literally met him the day that he was leaving. And I was like, he's either going to sell them to someone else or they're just going to get thrown out. So I decided to buy them and put them on my wall. And now I do videos explaining insect biology, explaining like uh, I'm really interested in color. Like how are these butterflies and beetles shiny doing like demonstrations with these insects to give them kind of like a second life in my opinion. Cause otherwise like, who knows where they would be or if they would be anywhere at all. Yeah. Well, they are very beautiful. I, I, I guess butterflies kind of almost have a, like a free pass a little bit into the insect <laughs> yeah. world, right? Can you know you... what? A lot of people are afraid of butterflies. Really? Yeah. It, it blows my mind. I'm like, this is literally like the fairy of the insect world. How, how is this possible? But I've met, I met like a handful of people that are terrified of butterflies. Interesting because they don't <laughs> bite. There's, n there's nothing. And usually the caterpillars are cool to look at as well. Yeah. the ca <laughs> Some caterpillars can actually do, can actually sting. So the caterpillars, at least down here can be dangerous, but the adult form, the butterfly literally can't do anything. Wow. So can you, can you explain a little bit about the colors? Like you were saying, it's, yeah. it's super interesting. Yeah. Can, can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. My favorite <laughs> topic ever. All right. Go. Uh, so these, the bright blue ones are morphos and they have this specialized structure. You're getting down to like one micrometer down here. So super, super tiny. You need a, a scanning electron microscope or something similar or a TEM, which I forget what it stands for to actually see these structures. That's how small they are. And they're like, they're kind of like these like weird tree like structures that are just stacked next to each other. And so what happens is light enters that structure, it gets stuck and it can only come back out in a straight line. And like underneath that structure, there's pigments to absorb like reds and blue or reds and greens and other wavelengths that they don't want it to get out. Um, so just the blue is basically reflected. Wow. That process is 80% efficient and it's basically how our commercial LEDs work and our commercial LEDs, depending on, you know, if you got like a cheap one from Ikea, do you guys have Ikea in Canada? We do actually. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. So if you buy like a cheap LED from, from Ikea, like those LEDs reflect six to 7% light out of their structures and are only just generally with heat, 66% efficient. Um, so these butterflies are reflecting 80% light out of their wings. And so there's a lot of money going into right now to studying and trying to copy these structures for improved fiber optics. Um, some of these butterflies, I don't know if they're like a couple in this box, if you, depending on the angle that you look at it, the, the color will shift. It'll either disappear completely or will change to a different color depending on the structure. And those have like a disc-like structure where light will come in and bounce off one color if it bounces in the middle. And then if it bounces on the edge of the structure, will come out a different color and it's called color mixing. Um, and we're studying those for like security encryption. So imagine if you could put copy that structure and put a chip into a passport that changes color based on the wavelength or the angle of light that you're looking at it. Um, wow. so that's what I'm really interested in is like these kind of like the technology basically that butterflies and beetles are using and how we can copy and use those for, to improve our own stuff. Yeah. Well, that's super interesting. I did not know any of that. And the, it, it is amazing how much of our technology comes out of the animal and insect world, right? We have it, basically these things are doing it way better than we can and looking at it at a microscopic scale. So that's, that's super interesting. And I guess, the, um, obviously the butterfly is not producing heat when it's doing this or not really right compared to an LED. That's actually how we got glow sticks is that that was one of the big mysteries for a long time was how do fireflies create cold light? And so we studied fireflies and now we basically copy their phosphorus chemical reaction to make glow sticks. Here we oh, are. interesting. That's cool. Yeah. Cause I actually never thought about that, that they actually, there's no heat coming off of there's that. No that. It's, 
the the firefly reaction is something like 98 or 99 percent energy efficient wow so we can't even get close no except for glow sticks (laughs) except for glow sticks right Yeah. yeah so so obviously that probably influenced your jewelry that you make yes yes can can Um, you talk a little bit about that yeah i'm actually wearing some of it right now because like i love them um the beetle comes from thailand they are eaten and so it's basically just a byproduct of the food industry much like leather is um and i i love wearing these earrings out because people are like oh i like your earrings i'm like well they're actually beetle shells and people are like what did you paint them with i was like i didn't paint them with anything they're just that shiny they're just that iridescent they're just that colorful and the color will never fade because it's structural it's just reflecting light like a prism so the structure never never changes so what's the process to make it does it come like that in that sort of sheath thing or like you No, i I built yeah i built it so i i have like so there's a whole bunch there yeah there's a whole bunch there just lined up Mm -hmm. and so do you have to coat it with something to keep it hard or nope they're naturally that hard because like think about the biology of the beetle um beetles especially these are wood boring beetles so they're like they're on the ground they're getting knocked around they're under bark they're under um they're inside logs they're under logs and the the reason actually um i have a glare but um I'm just going to take my bugs off a little. Yeah, let's bring them. Okay. So, (laughs) demonstration. So, the beetles, uh, their first wing has been modified into this shell. That's kind of what we recognize as beetles. And that's because there's these big membranous hind wings underneath. So, you can see see those. Yeah, Um, definitely. And so, that's what the cover, that's what the shell is for. It's hard to protect those hind wings because that's what's doing all the flying. If you break your hind wings, you're stuck on the ground forever. And so these these shells naturally have to be light, but also have to be strong to protect the beetle. And so I don't do anything. I poke a hole in them with a needle and then you're like giving away all my secrets. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, I hope people don't start mass producing these. <laughs> so can you sell them, right? I do. Um, I, have a, I have an Etsy shop called Cybugs Collections. And yeah, you can get them yourself. Is the bug on your necklace, is that a real... Yes. That's yes, real as well. So that's yeah, just that's real as well. Um, yeah. So this is I got this done by an artist called uh, Amanda Leg. She runs she her website is Sticks, Stones, and Bones. And this I got to pick the beetle. This is a real beetle under here. It's electroformed in copper. So she gets all of her beetles from a breeder. And once the beetles just naturally die, um, she collects them and then makes jewelry out of them. Oh, that's very cool. Yeah, that's cool. Very, very nice. And uh, yeah, so if anybody wants the, or at least the, the earrings or the the beetle jewelry, they can find that on your Etsy. Yes. Easily. Yeah. So, and I think I also saw that you do some photography as well. Some like macro. Yeah, I do. I'm a big proponent of like cell phone photography. Your, your cell phones are so good now. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm actually going to my entomology conference to run a workshop on how to get better macro with your phone. And it ended up... <laughs> I kind of fell into photography. I never considered myself a photographer. It's just like when I was teaching, especially classes like forensic entomology or um, the insect natural history course in Ecuador, we don't identify insects based on color really because there's beetles that can look like wasps. There's flies that can look like wasps. Like there's moths that can look like beetles. Like, so color is not at all helpful because there's so many mimics. So we're looking at things like, how many antennal segments does it have? What are the shape of its feet? Like how many toes does the beetle have? And when you look up like tarsal claw and like a family name, there aren't many pictures on Google. <laughs> Surprisingly, no one looks up beetle toes. I don't know what people are <laughs> what actually. What the hell? <laughs> yeah, I know, like it's just all cat photos or something. I don't yeah. know. Um, so I ended up getting into it cause I was creating all, I was trying to make it easier for students because entomology is you know, typically a lot of this information is hard to get to. Like you need someone to show you what you're looking at. It's just hard if you're starting. So I was trying to make that, that huge, I don't know, curve, less curvy, I guess, <laughs> like easier just for students to come in 
and you know have a sheet and be like, this is what I'm looking for. So I ended up in macro photography because I needed to take pictures of bug bits for presentations, for worksheets, for students. And then it kind of opened up this world. The, the more you look, the more you see and the more beautiful you see these things actually are. And then like after my taxonomy class in grad school, which is identifying insects, I was just like running around with my phone. And because like I was in grad school, I didn't have enough money to buy like a super fancy camera. So I just, and that was when cameras started getting really good on cell phones. I was like, I'm just going to push these cell phones like to the max. Mm -hmm. And then I must admit, when I did get a nice camera, I was still really lazy and just did it on my phone <laughs> because then it's like easier to upload to Instagram. You can edit it on your phone easier. And so, yeah. And right now, like my phone, I have a, I'm going to like shamelessly plug Samsung, I guess. Um, but I have a Note 8 and I can get pictures of bugs that are, you know, three ish millimeters long and they wow. still come out clear enough for Instagram. Like I'm not going to blow it up and print it on my wall eight by 10 or anything, but so those pictures yeah, that right. I think when I clicked on uh, like the photography link that I saw on your website, are most of those taken yeah. with an, or with a cell phone? Yeah, most of those are taken with a cell phone. <laughs> That's really crazy because they do look like the detail is pretty impressive. Yeah. I didn't even realize that a phone could do that. And and that's yeah. one of the cool things that I think that you're doing is that you're you're making insects way more interesting than people think. Oh, thank you. Yeah, and I think that the, those pictures do a do an awesome job. And same with the jewelry wow. too. I think that that's thank um, you. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of just my goal is just to be like, bugs are so cool. You should like all of the bugs. Yeah. And some bugs are maybe a little bit scary, but you just don't have to touch them. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. Like do dogs are scary. Like some dogs are scary. I just don't touch those. That's right. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing is most insects are actually harmless for the most part. Right. Yeah. Um, so is there any other interesting insect facts that you'd like to, uh, to uh, let us know before, before we wrap up? There's funny things about insects. Um, so this is one that I, I particularly like with the kids. There's this thing called the beaded lace wing. And it, as a larva, it eats termites and literally farts. It, <laughs> it literally farts to knock the termites out. It's like a gas, a toxic gas that's released from its butt. And a <laughs> staggering fart can knock out six termites at a time. Does it kill them? Uh, and it doesn't quite kill them, but it does knock them out long enough for the, uh, for the lace wing to come over and just like eat them. Wow. Which is, I think is hilarious. <laughs> so I, yeah. So getting back to that, uh, why they're connected with aliens. <laughs> it, right. Yeah. Why they're connected with aliens. <laughs> yeah. So is, is that some of the things that you guys covered when you did the, cause I actually am not super familiar with dragon con, but by the looks of it, it's like a, um, well, it's a convention for like, I don't yeah, know. Yeah. It's like a sci-fi a pop culture convention. There's 80,000 people there. Everyone's in, co almost everyone's in costume. Um, it, it's just, it's like where all the nerds come out of the woodworks from all over the world <laughs> and just come together for fun for five days. And my favorite part about Dragon Con is not only is it like this kind of like, you know, everyone's in costume and hanging out, but there's all these really interesting panels. Like um, there's, there was one like, they, they had a telescope and you could go and use a telescope at night. Uh, there's the whole science track, which is what I was a part of. Uh, and there, were, like, we had paleontologists talking about Jurassic Park. We had us entomologists talking about aliens. Um, we had, uh, we actually talked about the science of Frankenstein's monster and if, like, Frankenstein's monster could even happen. Um, there was a whole panel like, does it fart, for example, <laughs> that my friend was on. So the beaded lace wing showed up in that one. And so it's like, I really like Dragon Con because it's this combination of pop culture, but also, you know, a really interesting way to do science communication. Yeah, no, that's definitely, that's what I was kind of intrigued about it. Cause I guess you guys are giving a scientific uh, yeah. d demonstration or discussion about insects, but it kind of fits in. Right, exactly. And that, that part to me is so fun. Like I, there are people when they have like, they do their science thing, they just like walk up to whoever and like they think their science is so cool. So they just like blab to the other person. The other person is like, yeah, I actually don't care. Can you stop talking now? <laughs> so I always, I, I always try and put insects in a context that someone is interested in. And 
I think that makes the communication more effective. So when you go to Dragon Con, I'm not just going to like babble about like one an, a random aspect of biology. If I can put it in a context, like people who are interested in sci-fi would be interested in aliens. Maybe they'd be interested in where the inspiration from these aliens came from. It happens to be insects. So the way that you go about it is different and it gives you opens up this whole really interesting route for science communication. Um, the other thing that I did that was not an official part of the panel whatsoever is like, I love Pokemon. Like Pokemon got me into science. And so I like got Pokeballs and there's this, uh, there's this character that's always been in all the Pokemon. They're called the bug catchers. They're like the first Pokemon trainers you meet and they all have bug Pokemon. So I like got my insect net and my Pokeballs and I just walked around with live insects that with a sign that said, ask me about my live bugs. And people would come over and be like, what live bugs? It's like these ones on my hands. And people are like, wow, you're like a real life bug catcher. That's so cool. And then they would just start naturally because they're curious asking me about insects. Um, and so I think it was just such a fun and interesting way to, to bring insights to people who like probably never would have thought about or gone to or been interested in bugs. Yeah. Well, that's, that's awesome. I mean, that's one of the, it's the way to do it. You, it instead of looking, cause I think some people will be maybe involved in something like insects and just kind of be resentful that other people don't like them. Yeah. But instead it's like find a way to make that connection. And there's so many exactly. different areas that influence or insects influence our lives that we probably aren't even aware of that uh, you just kind of bridge that. So that that's perfect. And I think everyone has an experience with bugs. Like I feel like I'm really lucky. I'm just the PR for insects, but everyone has had an experience with bugs. Like whether it be pests, whether it be pretty butterflies, whether it be like dragonflies, I saw that one time, or whether it be like they were just walking on the trail and they found this really weird thing that no one could tell them what, the, what it was. So I feel particularly lucky studying bugs because when I, when people ask me what I do and I say, Oh, I study bugs. They're like, Oh, I saw this one thing once. Can you tell me what it was? Or like, I've had this problem. Can you tell me what happened? Like, is there, are there actually really brown recluses where I live? And most of the time the answer is no. Brown recluses <laughs> like have a very small geographic range, but it's a, it's a, a spider, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's and a, it's one of our most venomous spiders in North America. Oh, okay. No. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I, everybody probably thinks everything is, is one of those, but it's not. Yeah. There's about 30 other spiders that have the same coloration and the same size and the same shape and about, and where you'd find it. This is back to like why you can't use color to identify arthropods. Uh, you actually identify brown recluses by the number of eyes they have because brown recluses are weird in the fact that they only have six eyes, whereas almost all other spiders, except for that family have eight or more. So, so you need to get as close to being able to count their eyes. <laughs> yeah. So people are like, this is a brown recluse. And normally we just ID them based on location. So if they're like, oh, this is a brown recluse in Utah, you're like, uh, no, actually it's not. Like we had brown recluses in Georgia, but even in Athens, I was too far north and near Atlanta to have brown recluses. So. Well, I, the, we have lots of little spiders here, but one of the, we have this huge spider called a dock spider. I don't know if that's it's probably not a scientific name. I think people, people call them dock spiders or yeah. I don't know what else the other names are, but, but for Canada, it's really big. Like it's a, it's a really big spider. And I actually saw one last week at, on uh like they hang out near the water, but uh, oh, they're probably a type of fishing spider then. Yeah. I think that's what it is. Yeah. Fishing yeah. spider. Yeah. That's what they're, I think that's, I looked it up after and I think that's what it was. So those are quite big, but, uh, but really neat to look at. Yeah. But again, they're, they're not really venomous. Like they, if they bit you it would hurt, but you wouldn't have any problems. You just be like, that hurt. Uh, and they're really docile. Like the first thing they do is just run away. So yeah, yeah she had like a big egg sack and she was just, yeah, it's so cool. yeah, it, yeah was it was super cool. So where can people find you to learn more about bugs? I know you have a YouTube and I and, do. Yeah. Um, and that's one of my goals is to like work on my YouTube more though, than I'm actually home <laughs> and not traveling like crazy. Uh, so my YouTube is Cybugs. It's just youtube.com slash Cybugs. Um, my Twitter is also Cybugs. My Facebook is also Cybugs. Um, my Etsy is Cybugs Collections. And then my Instagram is Cy.bugs because someone took Cybugs without a oh, peach. no. <laughs> Peasant. Dang it. <laughs> so, yeah. And so you can find me and message me on any of those platforms and I will be happy to talk to you. Oh, and actually I was going to ask you about, you guys have a little, I think you and your friend and, and maybe another um, entomologist have asked an entomologist. Ask an entomologist. Yes. Um, that's a blog that we run. Uh, so 
It's just askentomologists.com. If you look up Ask an Entomologist, we are actually now the first hit on Google. So win. Nice. Um, and then our Twitter and Instagram is bug questions. And we are Ask an Entomologist on, on Facebook. So if someone and, has a question, they can just reach out to you guys. Yes. I actually spent like an hour and a half yesterday going through the backlog of just Facebook messages that we had. Wow. Because <laughs> when I was at Dragon Con, I, I just like was so busy. I was, I was busy from like 9 a.m. to 2 a.m. every day. So I just like didn't get a chance to hit them. So I've been like backlogged for about a week on Facebook. Um, but yeah, you can send us questions via Twitter, Facebook, um, email or Instagram. And we will get to you. Sometimes we're busy and it takes a little bit because we do it. It's a volunteer project. We don't get paid for it or anything. So it's like we are literally donating our time to, to help you identify your bug or, you know, answer your questions about bugs. So please be patient with us, but we will get to you. I promise. Perfect. Yeah. So if you, if you do reach out to them, make sure you're patient, but uh, there's, you, and you have tons of information on, and tons of nice pictures and, and everything on your Instagram and Twitter. Yeah. And mm-hmm. uh, so that's great. So I really appreciate you doing this. This is great. Yeah, thank I you think so much. I'm going to be, I mean, it's almost winter here. It's not winter. It's going into fall, but our winter, everything dies, I think. So in the yeah. spring, I'm going to start looking and I'll be a little bit more interested in, in bugs and I'll take a little closer look, I think. Excellent. That's what we like to hear. Great. <laughs> Tweet me your pictures. <laughs> yeah, I will. I'll send them to uh, send them to you. Excellent. All right, everybody. That is it for today's episode. Were you somebody that was kind of afraid of insects or creeped out by them before listening to the show? And did this episode change your perspective? I mean, how could it not? How can Nancy's enthusiasm not shift you a little bit? It's always very exciting talking to someone who is that engaged in what they're doing and clearly Nancy has a love for what she does Um, if you are ever in Ecuador I would highly recommend going down and getting a a tour by uh, from her I think that would be an unbelievable experience and I will post all of her information on the show notes that'll be at animalsathome.ca slash podcast and just click on this episode and you'll find links to everything uh, her YouTube channel her Etsy so you can take a look at her jewelry Instagram and Twitter as well as her website you can take a look at some of the photography she's done and if you are at all interested in listening to the panel discussion that she had at Dragon Con it is available on her YouTube channel so make sure you go check that out as well of course links in the show notes also included in the show notes, I did find a video on YouTube that kind of went viral, and it is a video of a water beetle taking down a garter snake, and that's something that Nancy had mentioned in this episode. I did find video evidence that to be the truth, so it is pretty wild to see, so that is in the show notes as well, so definitely go check that out. If you're enjoying the show and you'd like to show your support, you can head to animalsathome.ca slash podcast. There you'll find a link that says buy me a coffee and you can literally buy me a coffee. It's just a $3 donation that comes my way. Coffee basically fuels this podcast, so I really appreciate anybody that does that. But of course, the the money that I get through those donations does go to paying for server space and equipment and, and so on. You can buy an Animals at Home t-shirt. There's several different uh, logos and styles on the website. That's animalsathome.ca slash shop. $5 for every shirt gets donated directly to the Amazon Rainforest Conservancy. And of course, liking, subscribing on iTunes and YouTube and sharing the content is one of the best things you can do for me. I really appreciate you guys for listening. We'll talk later.